stand and sing together. I can see the clouds rolling in. I can feel the winds, they try to shake me. I will not be moved. My feet are on the rock. I can feel the waters rise. I can hear the howling lies that haunt me. Fear won't hold me now. My feet are on the rock. When I feel my hope about to break. Joy on the horizon, hear my faith is down. I'll stand on solid ground. Hope I'm about to break, I will be to your unchanging grace. Let the waters come and the earth give way. I'll be dancing in the rain. The rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. Stomp your feet and clap your hands, my feet are on the rock. Come on! On Christ's solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. Stomp your feet and clap your hands, my feet are on the rock. On Christ's solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. Stomp your feet and clap your hands, my feet are on the rock. And I feel my heart about to break. I will cling to your heart. Let the waters come and the earth give way. I'll be dancing in the rain. My feet are on the rock. My feet are on the rock. Ooh, my feet are on the rock. Amen. Hey, Amen. give me praise this morning. Amen. 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 Well, good morning, church. Good morning. It is so good to be with you this morning in the house of the Lord to worship the name of Jesus. We are so glad that you have joined Friends Church. Thank you for being here in person with us. Or if you're joining us online, so good to be with you all. My name is Pastor Jeremy, and I just want to welcome you. And let you know also that if you are a first-time visitor, or maybe you're, you visited and you've been here before, but it's been a while since you've been back, they're at the Welcome Center, out, you know, past these doors, out back, and then also in the Grand Concourse. We have a gift bag for you that we just want to give you. So if you are a first-time guest, be sure to, after service, go check out the Welcome Center and get your gift bag that we want to give you. So thank you so much for being here. It's so good to be with you all this morning. In Jesus' great commissioning, one of the last moments he was with his disciples, he said, all authority in heaven and earth is given unto me. We need to remember that. It's in his authority. All authority on heaven and earth has been given unto me. Therefore, go and make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you to the very end of the age. Folks, we got our work cut out. Our commissioning, our work has not changed. God is still counting on us to do our part. So today, as we celebrate the redemptive ministry of Christ, let's sing his praises, let's celebrate together. Jesus. 
every chain, break every chain, break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain, break every
like you mean it. There is power you, Jesus. in the name of Jesus to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Now, church, I want you to know we are the army in this song. You realize that, right? Can you put your hands in the air? And let's just sing it. There's an army rising. That's us, church. Sing it out. Sing it. There's an army. There's, There's an, an army rising up. Church, we are your people. There's, There's an, an army rising up to break every chain, break every chain, break every Church, let's pray together. God, we just thank you for time to come and sing and praise in the name of Jesus. God, may we pour our hearts out to you this morning. May we just open up. Let the Holy Spirit take over this place. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Give your heart to the Lord this morning and just uh, tell him what's on your heart. He's there to listen. So let's close out our worship time. You come and kneel at this altar. You sit at your seat. You pray while you stand. Just be with the Lord. is my beginning The line drawn in the sand The end of all my striving Now I am born again There Jesus was forsaken So I will never be His grace is my salvation The gift of God The work of Calvary It is done It is His mercy is complete His love is not in question Son of God has spoken over me It is done It is finished Christ has won Love has triumphed over death forever. Stronghold bowing to the same. Resurrection power 
done. It is finished. Christ has won. Thank you, Lord. He is risen. Grace is here. Love has tried. clap of praise this morning. It is finished. Amen. Amen. While we've got y'all standing, why don't you say hi? Good morning. Tell somebody they're awesome today uh, that's standing next to you. Just want to inform you about a few things that are going on at the church. Uh, things that are coming up. We do have a baby dedication coming up next Sunday, and then graduating Sunday is, or graduation Sunday is May 15th, so if you're a senior in high school, uh, or uh, for the baby dedication service, please sign up in your bulletin uh, today for those events if you could. Uh, you can also sign up online. Details are in the bulletin. Uh, also, uh, Youth pa Pancake Breakfast will be the week after that, so we've rescheduled that for May 20. Second, the youth pancake breakfast. You can actually come to church and eat pancakes in between service. So, I mean, you can't you can't miss. So that's May twenty second. That's a fundraiser for our youth group. And I I think summer is coming. I'm not sure if next week will be third winter, but if summer is coming, then VBS is also coming. And so you can sign up your kids or your grandkids already for VBS. Um, and also you can sign up if you'd like to volunteer. So there are lots of spots that we need help with. If uh, you're not comfortable in leading a group, we have tons of helpers that we also need. And most people are working with two or three uh, other people in each of their groups. So there is something for everybody. But also Charity will be working on some of the VBS decorations and advertisements and those type of things as well on Wednesday nights at 6 p.m. And that'll be in the Friends Center, which is the old sanctuary. So if you can volunteer or help out with any of those things, please do uh, sign up. ASAP. We would love for you to be able to help us, and the number of kids that we get to minister to is just amazing. Uh, also, there's a ton of sports stuff going on with summer coming up as well. Uh, ballroom dance class starts tonight, and then the Friends, uh, our church softball league, as well as Upwards Basketball, which is first to sixth grade basketball. Uh, Sign-ups for all of those things. You can see Anna uh, out in the Grand Concourse. Uh, she has a little kiosk there that if you have questions or would like to sign up for any of the sports ministries, uh, please go out and see her or sign up in your bulletin. As we continue with uh, worship uh, this morning, I just want to say thank you for all for being faithful and, and for giving. And all of the ministries that we do, 
uh, with things like VBS and the sports ministries all happens because you all give. So many lives are reached and so many lives are changed. And if you'd like to give this morning, we do have offering boxes as you're coming in and out of the sanctuary, both in the back here as well as in the Grand Concourse uh, next to the other main doors. You can also text to give to the number on the screen or visit our website. And we're just so grateful uh, for all of the ministry that we are able to do because you do give. Let's go to the Lord this morning in prayer for our offering. Father God, we come to you in thanks this morning for blessing us. Lord, in calling us to serve, to be your disciples, Lord, we give back to you, both with our tithes and offerings, but also our lives. We volunteer to serve both in this church and outside of it, Lord. Lord, we give cheerfully this morning because we live our lives for you because you gave your life for us. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Thank you, Jake. 
And if uh, you'd like to see him perform some more, St. Clair's will be performing the uh, Wizard of Oz here this coming weekend. <laughs> we have actually lots of our students, um, several of our students here in the church. Uh, you guys can raise your hand. Why don't you raise your hand? Anthony, I see over here. Jake here are performing in the musical this week. I had a chance to go see him on Friday and would encourage you to go and support them. And of course, uh, Wayne is uh, the director over there, so just wonderful. Would you stand with me this morning as we read from God's Word? We're in Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 20. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said. And I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and his brother John. They were in a boat with their, with their father Zebedee preparing their nets. And Jesus called them. And immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. This is the word of God. Please be seated. It is great to be with you here this morning and to be able to share out of God's Word. You know, I don't know if you realize how wonderfully blessed we are to have such w talent. We have a lot of musical talent in this church and have these young people who are doing such a fantastic job of singing and being a part of wor our worship. Uh, a lot of churches would really love to have that kind of ministry going on so thank you youth thank you youth workers yeah, give them a hug tell them how much you appreciate them we thank you for your participation let's begin with prayer dear father what a privilege it is to be here to look into your word i thank you that you want to teach us this morning and that you're wanting us each one to connect with the lost world to tell them the hope of Christ. Holy Spirit, I pray that you'll convict and convince us. Help us to see where we can be active participants in your great redemptive plan. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. We're in a series of messages starting this year on glorifying God. And today I want to look at obeying Jesus' great calling. This is a quick review. You remember we started this series of messages with the great command. The great command to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and body, you know. And then went on to talk about how God's great love for us. For God so loved the world that he did what? He was only begotten son. So as we look at these passages, we not only see God's great love, but then we see the coming of the king, Jesus Christ, who demonstrated how he had given up everything for us and then calls on us to do the same thing. We're going to go more and more into that as we go forward. And then the last couple of weeks, we talked about the great compassion. Jesus' great compassion are illustrated by his concern and care for the lost. What is your heart for the lost? Are they a burden on your heart? Is there someone you're praying for? Do you sense a calling to share the hope of Christ that's in you with someone else? You see, Jesus came here with a broken heart over the stranglehold of death. He then showed his great compassion by going to the cross so that we might find victory through his victory over death. Death is our enemy. And to be he became our perfect sacrifice for our sins, defeating death's stranglehold. Well, today I want to look at God's great calling. In the passage that Matt just read for us, Pastor Matt, we see Jesus along the Sea of Galilee calling men to come and to serve, casting their nets into the lake. There were two way, multiple ways to fish at that time. One was to stand on the shore throw your net out and then draw it in and catch fish 
If you go then on to the sons of Zebedee, James and John, they would go out in a boat. They were with their father getting their nets ready to go out when the call came from Jesus. So as we look at this passage, somehow we seem to view the disciples, and this is, I think, a misnomer. We view the disciples as professional followers of Christ. In reality, Jesus in our text invites them to come alongside of him or be a part of his ministry, and in doing so, he would make them into what? Fishers of men. He took something they were very familiar with and said, I'm going to turn you into fishers of men. Maybe a question for us today is, how are we going about fishing for men? How we participate in his great calling? Well, Jesus' method was discipling ordinary men. As Jesus is walking by the Sea of Galilee, he sees these fishermen. If you look back to the previous verses, just prior to our text, uh, there in that he talks about his preaching ministry, Jesus' preaching ministry. He had a message for a world that needed to hear the hope they could find in him. Jesus was the fulfillment of prophecy. He was the light shining in the darkness. People were living in the shadow of death. He came to put light upon this world and, and into the lives of people. He was calling them to repent and receive his kingdom. In other words, they could have life if they turn from sin and disbelief. And it is disbelief that disqualifies us, our, our inability to believe and trust in Jesus. We need to trust in him. And when we have that belief, and we are really truly trusting in Christ, then a lot of the things we struggle with will become turned upside down or upside right. We're going to want to do the things of God. So as we look at this passage, Jesus is calling men to be his followers, men that he would equip to carry the message of hope to the rest of the world, which brings us to a, how would you say, a problematic area for the church. This is where we're failing. We have this picture of professional ministry, of pastors and missionaries. And if we, we don't have those degrees or titles, then we are disqualified from ministry. Let me tell you, that is not God's plan. It is good to have those who have studied and who have invested themselves in full-time ministry. But that does not negate the vital role that each of us are called to play in the building of the kingdom. What God, is, what God has called us to do is be a part of his great redemptive plan. Every one of us. What God has in plan store for you is that you will be a light to someone. And the question is, what is God calling you to do to reach into this world? He has uniquely equipped you for his service. And how are you using those skills for the building of his kingdom? Could you use the gifting that come along uh, and come alongside of someone else and help them? Is that your overarching desire to somehow use whatever skills and talents and and resources you have to reach others? I saw my dad do this in a minor way, but it was one of his ministries. He had a garage. He was very talented in fixing things. He was a tool and die maker growing up on the farm. We had to work all the time and fix everything we had. There wasn't money to go buy new equipment all the time. So he would invite my friends to come over. We'd put transmissions in, engines in cars. We'd rebuild tractors and combines, and we'd help our neighbors. And it was my dad's way of mixing in with other people and sharing the hope. I heard him more than once tell other people about how God had changed his life. My grandfather, who was tree tall to me, was just a, a farmer and worked for the state highway garage. And, but people were poor back then. People didn't have money. And so he would cut people's hair for free. He wasn't a professional barber. He didn't charge for it. But I remember going to my grandpa and grandma's and there'd be the men of the community stopping by to get a haircut. And he would just clip their hair and all the time telling them about what Christ means to him. I don't know what gift or talent you have. Some of you women can do all kinds of things that could help other younger women. 
Some of you men have skills that could help the young men of our church, maybe in construction or maybe in plumbing or electricians. Maybe it's just a skill that you've acquired. But how are you using what God has given you to reach others? Are you looking for someone who you can pour yourself into, invest yourself in, being available in life's happenings, sharing God's lessons that you've learned, things that you've learned from Scripture that you could help that person with? God gives you those talents and abilities for a purpose, and that is to reach others. You know, when you think about church growth, look around this room. We got a nice congregation. Last service, there were probably 130, 140 people there. Nice crowd, nice little crowd. But when I think about that group, if I go out on the street and invite people in, I'm only one person. But if 250 to 300 of you who are gathered here, maybe 400, would go out there purposefully having prayed and looking for a person that you can tell the good news to, can you imagine what could happen to this church? It would be exponential growth, believing and trusting the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to challenge you. This isn't in my sermon. I'm throwing it in extra. I want to challenge you to do that, to begin praying that God will send five people into your life who you can impact with the message of Christ. They're not your special project. They're people that you love, people that you want to see come to wholeness, people that you want to see connected to the body of Christ. And I'm not telling you to go out and steal sheep from another church. That's not the point. We need to find people who are lost, who are not connected, who do not know Jesus, who need to know Jesus. Who are they going to be for you? In 1973, I had kind of lost my bearings in life, and I had really gave my heart I finally finally gave my heart to Christ and instead of going back to college I worked in a sheet metal factory called Fairfield Engineering and it hit me one day if you're going to go into ministry if that's what God's calling you to do why aren't you doing it now I didn't, and I could have said well I don't have degrees I'm not a pastor but God laid it on my heart now I'm telling you this not to say oh look at me but to say you can do it because there in that factory as I began to talk to men I started a little Bible study at lunchtime now we didn't go over that time we stayed to the bells but we had a little Bible study we prayed for one another and you know when I go home every once in a while I'll run into one of those guys who's in that Bible study you see God is preparing you to be an active participant in the kingdom of God. And I want to ask you, what's keeping you from being who God would have you to be? Is it fear? Is it inability to organize your time? Is it, I don't have that sense of calling? I want to tell you something. God is calling you. <laughs> a lot of people say, oh boy, I'm running on a tangent here today. I'm sorry. But a lot of people say, Say, you know, uh, you know, I want to know the will of the Lord. Well, the will of the Lord is for you to go out and win people to Christ. <laughs> Telling them about Jesus. Praying for them. Helping them. Oh, yeah, you. Well, we're going to get into this as we go further. I'm sorry. We'll get back to where I'm at. So Jesus invited them to follow him. You notice it's a repeated theme. He says to Peter and, and uh, there in the first group, he said, come follow me and I will send you out to fish for people. Then he comes to the sons of Zebedee, and he says, come follow me. And both times, they immediately left. They're connecting with him would prepare them to reach out to other people. I will send you out to fish for men. Now note the response immediately. They followed him. Following, uh, that word follow comes from the word which conveys the idea of not only following as a disciple, but one who is committed to imitating the one he follows. All right? Well, I know you read your Bibles. You come here and you sing beautifully. Many of you help in multiple, multiple areas of ministry. But you feel that sense of calling in your life? that I'm here to serve the King of Kings. I'm here to help someone find their way into the kingdom of God. Jesus was 
all about calling men and women into saving relationships with him. He ministered to tax collectors, to women who had broken lives. He called for children to come to him. And these disciples were now going to follow him and follow his example. I read a statistic this past week. I don't have any way of corroborating it. <clears throat> but it, if it's true, and I believe it probably is, it basically said that 95% of Christians today have never shared their faith with someone else. I want to tell you something. That's why we're losing the battle. We've got to get people out of the pews and into the world telling the good news of Jesus Christ. Wherever you're at, whatever your vocation, however God has called you, when Jesus invited these men to follow him, he was inviting them into his life. They went to social events. They walked together. They engaged in faith conversations. They shared in joys and sorrows of ministry. They were able to see how Jesus dealt with religious hypocrisy. And yes, there's hypocrisy in churches. Somebody said, I don't want to go to that church full of hypocrites. I said, there's always room for one more. You know, a hypocrite is somebody play acting. Well, I think we all do that at some point in our lives. But that's no excuse for not connecting to the body and becoming involved. No, they shared in sorrows and joys. He taught them how to deal with hypocrisy. They saw his dependence upon the Father. They witnessed his willingness to sacrifice. And bear, there's a big one. A lot of people are willing to serve as long as it doesn't cost them anything, as long as there's no sacrifice. They experience this personal forgiveness in the midst of their failures. So life to life ministry goes beyond the classroom teaching on Scripture and explaining Scripture to entering into that follower's personal God story, you being a part of their life. I work for an old farmer. He wasn't a very big guy. I was probably few inches taller and stronger but you know I worked for him and inevitably he would talk to me about the Lord and you know when I rebelled against God and kind of threw the baby out with the bath water so to speak he was the one who came to me and looked me in the eye a little bit of a guy said Jerry God's calling you you cannot run from this I didn't like it when he told me that. Kind of messed up my plans. I had it all figured out what I was going to do. But then I realized what he was saying was right. Those words haunted me. So what I'm saying to you is, every one of us needs to be involved. Robert Coleman in his book, Master Plan of Evangelism, and by the way, I, I got the privilege of studying under him. What a man of God points out that the initial objective of Jesus was to enlist men who could bear witness of his life and carry on his work after he returned to the Father. Jesus knew he'd only be here for a while. He was going to give his life as a sacrifice for ours. And he told them that I'm going to send the Holy Spirit who will empower you to be the kind of witnesses you need to be. We need saving grace of Jesus Christ and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And look out, world, here we come. I mean, it is going to be incredible what God can do when a church gets on fire and filled with the Spirit of God for a ministry. You know, these men were not the sort of men that anyone who was trying to change the world would have recruited. The rabbis of their day would choose the best and the brightest. Being chosen, you had to be able to memorize huge amounts of Scripture. They, they were looking for the cream of the crop. These men who Jesus were, was choosing... They'd been passed over. They were not the kind of men that the religious people of that day wanted. Well, I want to tell you something. If the seminary had been choosing me, they'd have passed me over too. I wasn't what you call prime for ministry. I'm surprised this church let me come here and pastor. I had long hair down to my shoulders when I came here of myself but Wayne whipped me into shape All right buddy 
No, these weren't the kind of men who the world would have chosen as leaders. But listen to Acts 4.13. You might want to write that one down. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, listen to that, unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. That's the secret, folks. You want to be effective in your witness for Christ with your family, your neighbors, you got to be with Jesus. And there's no shortcut to that. You can't stick your Bible under your pillow and hope it soaks through. It means getting up, reading the Word, preparing your heart, getting in a Bible study, being in a discipleship group that's going to pray and encourage you in your faith walk. The secret is they'd been with Jesus. Jesus had taken ordinary men and turned them into world changers. Paul, writing to the church at Thessalonica, wrote a description of his ministry. I call it a ministry of presence. That's, that's exactly what I do with the sheriff's department and state patrol and even out at the football field in the past, is be there with them. Wait for that opportunity to speak truth into their life. This past week I was with an officer for several hours. We we're at a wreck and all sorts of situations. But in the midst of our conversation, he revealed to me his heart. He'd given his heart to Christ. And what a tremendous testimony of God answering prayers and all that. And I thought, thank you, God, for this day. And then I could speak truth into his life. So when we look at Paul's life, it was a ministry of presence. I don't get in those cruisers to preach to people. I get in there to look for an opportunity to speak hope. And that's what Paul was doing here. Listen to 1 Thessalonians 2, 6 through 12. You might want to write that one down and read it later on. But as apostles, by the way, notice the word apostles there is in the plural. Paul wasn't doing this all by himself. He was involved with other apostles, people who God was sending out into the world. Apostle merely means a sent one. Are you a sent one? Well, when we look at that term, he says, as an apostle of Christ, we, should have, we, could, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her little children. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you had become so dear to us. Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached uh, the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his eternal king or his kingdom of glory. So when we read that passage, I want to point out several things, five things here that stood out in Paul's ministry of presence. Number one, it wasn't a class. Some people think, well, we're going to have a class on discipleship. Well, maybe you can teach some things on discipleship, but that's not what discipleship is. It's not a class. It goes beyond the classroom. It's a living life face-to-face -face with. It wasn't a classroom. It was an act of love. Note the beautiful word picture he gives us. As a mother cares for her children, her children, in a similar way, we, are, we cared for you. When you think of a mother's example of how, how many hours, hours upon hours do they spend caring for those little ones, the daily routines, the sacrifice, the planning, the discipline. The overarching reality here is a mother is motivated by love. It was an investment, a life investment. Paul not only shared the gospel of God, the good news of Jesus Christ, but he says we shared our lives as well, ourselves. He reminds them that they worked hard to support themselves. You were our witnesses. We worked around the clock in order not to be a burden while we preached to you the gospel. We were living examples. You know, this is where we need to really be careful because a lot of people say to their children, do as I say, not as I do. Well, they may not say it that way, but that's the implication. It can never be that, folks. 
If we're going to be godly parents calling children to godly lifestyles, it has to be do as I say and do as I do. We need to set the example. He lived holy and righteous and blameless before you. We held you accountable as a father deals with the children. Notice he changes the role. As he talks about the role of a mother, now he's talking about the role of a father. You know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, urging you to live lives worthy of God. There was an accountability. And the fifth thing was Paul was a kingdom thinker. Do, notice what he says there in verse 11. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, urging you to live lives worthy of, the God, of God, who calls you into his eternal or into his kingdom and glory. We need to be kingdom thinkers. I'm just not telling my kids to go to church. I want them to go to church so they hear the message, they become saved, and they become a part of God's great kingdom, his God, God's great redemptive work. That's what we're called to do. But do you have a ministry of presence in someone's life? This past Sunday, I was with my grandsons. After church, we ran up to Canton and had lunch with them, and then we took a miniature golfing. And the two-and-a-half-year-old lasted to about the fourth hole. And I knew he was done when he threw the golf club on the ground and started to walk away. So I looked at little Lukey and I said, Lukey, let's go get some ice cream. Whew, we were out of there. <laughs> and uh, I got him some ice cream and was sitting down there. He's got ice cream all over his face. He looks at me and says, Grandpa, why do you like me? And I said, Lukey, Grandpa loves you very much. You're the best thing in my life. You're incredible to me. And he went back to eating ice cream. But you see, you aren't going to get those kind of questions if you don't spend time with them. If they don't know that you care about them. And the same thing with your friends. Oh, you can say you're their friends, wave at them. And... Or you can connect with them in meaningful ways that tells them you love them. I had a dear friend lose his wife this past week. I haven't seen him in probably 40 years. My life is just here, you know. He's back there. I called him about six times trying to get a hold of him. Finally, the other day I got a call back from him. And that's a guy that I grew up with. I said, man, I just love you. I'm hurting for you. I'm praying for you. He had a godly mother. And he said, I just appreciate this phone call so much, Jerry. And so I said, let's pray together. We prayed together over the phone. You see, I don't know when God's going to reconnect me to him. But I'm praying that my reaching out will give me an opportunity to speak more life into his life. But that doesn't just happen by chance. It comes as we become vulnerable, open our hearts to them, reach out to them. Paul was a kingdom thinker. And folks, I want you to understand this. This is not our home. Everything we have here will someday be destroyed. Now, I'm not telling you not to have nice things. I'm not telling you not to have dreams and all that sort of thing. But just remember this. Everything material you're pouring yourself into will come to naught. It will be destroyed. But what you invest in the life of someone else will have eternal ramifications. You know, we all have careers, vocations. We've trained. God has equipped us to do certain things and called us to them. These apostles, some of them were fishermen, tent makers, tax collectors. Luke was a physician. But I want to challenge you to think beyond your vocation to an odd vocation. That which you love, that which you cannot wait to get to do. And I'm not talking about rebuilding cars or 
or, you know, playing ball and all that. I'm talking about the avocation of loving the people God has put into your life making time for them, investing in them, seeing that as one of your highest priorities. I like what Kent Hughes said. Kent Hughes is one of my favorite writers. In the book, The Disciplines of a Godly Man. And he said it this way, For men who claim the name of Christ, there are two distinct courses of life available. One is to cultivate a small heart, This by far seems the safest way to go because it minimizes the sorrows of life. If our ambition is to dodge the troubles of human existence, the formula is simple. Avoid avoid entangling relationships. Don't give yourselves to others. Don't embrace noble ideas. If you do that, it should lead to a pretty unscathed life. To do this, one must cultivate a deafness the ability not to hear the discord of life. To do this, you will need to cultivate a blindness. You will shield yourself from seeing the ugliness of life and the struggles of others. All you have to do is put on the blinders, cultivate selective listening, only listening for the words of the pastor that say as encouraging and warm fuzzy things to you while the world screams for help and marches headlong over an eternal precipice. Or the other path is the call to a ministering heart. Embracing the call of God on your life. Cultivate the ability to listen and hear the heartaches of others praying by the power of the Holy Spirit that you'll be able to respond and open yourself to them and their needs. I'll guarantee you, when you do this, you're going to become vulnerable. Vulnerable to a whole plethora of sorrows and difficulties that will try your own soul. No one is, who has ever cultivated a ministering heart and lived to tell of life will tell you of a life of ease. But though you become vulnerable, you will also possess a heart of joy and you will leave your heart print on the world as you seek to imitate the life of Christ. Cultivate a willingness to get involved. Give yourself to ministering to others. Roll up your sleeves and get in the battle. I've told you this probably a hundred times, but you don't have to put up with me for long. And that is this. One of the life-changing events happened to me at Gilead Friends Church. Not only was that the church I grew up in, but I'll never forget one Sunday morning, I'd been asked to do something in the church. And I had a hundred excuses. I got to work overtime. I'm working on this. I'm helping my dad, you know. I'm playing soccer. I got to get in shape and all this stuff. And I'm sitting there in that old sanctuary at Gilead French Church, and the Lord said to me as Pastor Robinson was preaching, when are you going to stop telling me no? When are you going to stop telling me no? Hit me like a ton of bricks. That morning I went to the altar. I said, yes and amen, Lord. Whatever you ask me to do, I'm going to try and do it. Whatever door you open, I'm going to try and walk through it. I want to be that man. And you know what? He's opened one incredible opportunity after another in 42 years of ministry. You see, it takes the ability to say yes. 1 Thessalonians 2, 9 says, Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. We work day and night in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel to you. I'm going to give you five myths that we've got to dispel in the church. Number one, the first myth is there are two classes of Christians, clergy and laity. There's no evidence in Scripture that would validate that notion in the New Testament church. The church has no second-class citizens. We may have elders, we may have 
deacons, but we have no second class citizens. We're all in this together. Remember this, church. God does not look down and see male, female. He does not see slave or free. He sees us all equally and wants us equally involved. The big question is not what women should do and what men should do. The big question is how is men and women in Christ Jesus, how are we going to unite to see the kingdom of God come here on this earth? How can we work together to accomplish the calling of Christ? That's what we need to think about, folks. We all have skills and groups that we can reach into. But when we lay down that gauntlet and begin saying we all are in this together, God will do great things. Secondly, the clergy give ministry, the laity receive ministry. There's no scripture validation of this myth. The gospels and epistles call for every believer. We are a royal priesthood of believers. All of us are in this. And we're all to be full participants. Now, I will say this to you. In the church, not everybody can do everything, but you ought to be doing something. I reminded some folks last night, as I was talking to them, they were talking about the second coming of Christ. I said, yeah, won't that be wonderful? But I, said a, I read a bumper sticker many years ago that said, Jesus is coming soon, so try and look busy. We better get busy, hadn't we? Problem in today's church is we have too many fat baby Christians. They sit in the pew week after week and Bible study week after week, and they just keep taking it in, but there's no outgo. It's like the Dead Sea. A person, third myth, is a person becomes a minister by formal education and ordination. I don't see that in Scripture. The followers of Jesus, according to their gifts, ministered to each other and to other people. This attitude of ministry prepared the, propelled the message of Christ throughout the known world. George Fox, in the 1700s, I believe, sent out what he called the Valiant 60. 60 men, individual people, men and women, who invaded the world with the message of Jesus Christ. And Quakerism was one of the fastest growing groups of people in the face of the earth at that time. Somehow we've lost that. The Valiant 60. Fourth thing. Trained, fourth myth, trained clergy are more effective than lay people. I want to tell you something. That is not true. There's a role for trained clergy to help and to lead and to equip for service, but every believer should be involved somewhere and be effective in ministry. There are two irrefutable principles of church history that can be seen at the work in churches across the world. Number one, the church stagnates or declines when clergy hoard ministry as their elite possession. I'll give you an illustration of this in history. Susanna Wesley, John Wesley's mother, had a real burden for her children, really ministered to them. One day Samuel, her husband, was off doing politicking within the church, in the, the Anglican church, trying to get a better position. Suzanne at home with all the kids she had, she had a bunch of them. One time I think I read she had like 19 kids. But not all of them lived, but she had a lot of kids. But she got so she would be teaching the Bible from her kitchen door, and there'd be the whole town would show up. When her husband came home, the ordained clergy says, you can't be doing that, and shut it down. Duh. How dumb was that? You know, here she was reaching out, teaching the Bible. The second aspect, church thrives and transforms. This is that second principle, irrefutable principle. The church thrives and transforms new believers when ministry is shared with lay people. You young people here on these front rows, God's got a mission field where you're at in the school you're at to be a witness. Lay ministry, fifth myth. Lay ministry is something that just happens. Everything lasting and significant the church accomplishes must be intentional. 
It must have purposeful planning, promotion, training, and persistent implementation. And that means that you need to help get yourself prepared. We need to have everyone in this church able to share their faith at a minute's notice. Because you don't know when that moment will come for you to speak up, but you need to be prepared and know what you're going to say. And when you prepare yourself, the Holy Spirit will give you everything you need to say. He is the great educator. What will you do with it? For lay ministry to become effective in our churches, there needs to be an empowering from the pastors and the elders and the, and the ministry here. We must not only preach and encourage this, we must teach it and expect it. In a few weeks, Dr. Miller, the president of Malone University, will be here to speak to us. I've met the man multiple times. I have a great appreciation for him. And he's going to come and talk to us. And one of the things I'm sure he's going to talk about is the lay certificate that Malone University is preparing and training laity to take on greater roles in the church. And I want to say to you, one of the things you may not know is our own Pastor Matt has helped design that. And I know at least one person on our church is already involved in that training. What will you do? Will you get involved? Every believer must be helped to understand that doing ministry brings incredible joy to those who serve fully as much as it helps those who are served. Some of you may or may not know my lovely wife is retiring after 25 years of teaching. And two of the little boys in her class were talking, and one of them said to the other, he says, do you know our teacher's retiring? And the other little boy said, well, what's retirement? And the other one said, that's when you make enough money you don't have to work anymore. Well, it's not quite that way, is it? But folks, there's no retirement in the kingdom of God. We're not going to go up to heaven and send on a little cloud, I'll guarantee you that. God is a God of creation, a God of work that wants us to be prepared to work and to be a part of his great ministry. And what will you do? I can guarantee you one of these days they're going to replace me. <laughs> but don't you think I'm going to retire? Because God has a calling on my life that will go to the moment I die. I don't know what it'll be. Teaching here, ministering there, I don't know, but I guarantee you this. If Pastor Wayne was up to it, he'd be out preaching this morning at 86 years of age. There's no quit. There's no quit in the dog. You keep hunting. You keep ministering. What will you do with it? How will you hear this call? Some believe that we're on the verge of a second reformation. The first reformation gave the people the Bible. The second reformation will give the ministry to the people. When we see that happen, we will see the church thrive. It becomes an instrument God uses to transform lives, to accomplish astounding achievements, to challenge other congregations across the land to move to the front lines of battle. The goal of every minister should be to put himself out of work training, equipping the congregate or laity to lead to teach. Folks, that hits me right in the head because that's my big failure as a pastor. I didn't do more training, more preparing of you to go out and do the work. But it's not too late. I want us to put our heart behind this. I want to see every person in this church actively involved and bringing other people to the hope of Christ. And when we see that happen, it'll be a hallelujah moment. Let's stand. Father God, as we conclude this time, I know there's a lot of people here who do extraordinary things in ministry. They're ministering out of their homes. They're teaching Bible studies. They're working with children. I thank you, Father, for the great children's workers. We need even more. People, men of this church, Father, we pray that you raise up some men to go back there and help with those children. Those boys need to see godly men, Lord. We need some more men back there. I don't know what you're going to do, how you're going to propel us into ministry, but I believe you do not want us sitting on the sidelines. 
So I pray, Lord God, that you would not only equip us, but you would give us your great love and compassion, that we would see the needs, and we would roll up our sleeves and get in the battle. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I'm forgiven Because you were forsaken And I'm accepted But you were condemned And I'm alive and well Your spirit is within me Because you died and you rose again service a little differently I want you if God is speaking to you and giving you a fresh vision this morning about ministry if God is speaking to you I want to invite you to come down here I want to have prayer with you this is your chance I want to pray with you I want to see us go out in power so if God's speaking to you come on down let's pray come on don't be shy I know some of you God is speaking to you Tired of sitting on the line, Bench, you want to get in the ball game. This is a good day to do it. faces I can hear your hearts in 1971 I was playing on a football team and I wasn't very big and I wasn't very good so I spent most of my time sitting on the bench and then in 1972 I got to play a little bit and I'm going to tell you something it's a lot more fun to play than it is to sit on the bench something about hitting somebody that hard was just fun well that's football but I can tell you so personally, it's more fun to be in the ball game in the kingdom of God than to sit on the bench. So scrunching together. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Scrunching together. You can go bite each other. Okay, congregation, put your hands out. Let's, let's pray for them this morning. Father God, I thank you for these people who have heard the call. I don't know what you're going to do with them, but I know, Father God, there's a place for them. And I know, Father God, that just them coming forward is making a huge statement. I pray, Lord, for many of them that are already got their sleeves rolled up and are already working. I know it. I see them. But I know, Father God, you may want to launch them into new areas. You may have even bigger ministries now that you want them to take hold of. You said when we're faithful in the little things, you'll make us leaders in the bigger things. So I pray, Lord God, that we would be a congregation that ministers. I pray your Holy Spirit's falling upon them to equip them, to call them, to give them vision, to give them a sense of duty, responsibility, and privilege. And Lord, I just thank you. And I pray, Lord God, this church would be the be a bigger light than it's ever been because of the people going forth. And Lord, we tell you we love you. We want to hear when we enter this beautiful city and the saints around us appear, we want to hear somebody tell us, it was you who invited me here. That's what we want, Lord. We want to help 
be a part of your great redemptive plan. Bless us now. Give us vision. Open doors. Expand our horizons. Help us to see new ways that we can reach others for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Let's go get them.